in this session, we better combine message 21 and 22 together, making them just one message as message 21. And the title will be Saved by Grace to be the masterpiece of God. Saved by grace to be the masterpiece of God. And we read chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. The rest I leave to you. You better read in the afternoon by yourselves. Now in the meeting, we just read verses 4 through 10 of chapter 2. Let's do it. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in offenses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and seated us together in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, that he might display in the ages which are coming surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us by Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God before prepare, we should walk in them. I think for this message, we better go along with the online. First of all, this portion says, but God. But God. But. But here means a lot. I do know in the past, in some home of uh, a saint hanging on the wall, just a frame with these two words, right. but God. Amen. It's really good. Amen. But God. Amen. But God does give us a turn. In verses 1 through 3, we were just in that misery. But God came in. God now, here it says what? Reach in mercy. Now is the time for us to apply the enduring re um, mercy to our situation. We are reach in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us. If you read the note, you could see love always exercised to people in a good condition. When we are in a good condition, God doesn't need to exercise his mercy. Love is adequate. But when we are in a miserable condition, God's love will not go that down. See, then his mercy comes in. Mercy is exercised to us in a miserable situation, to persons who do not deserve anything of God. Amen. Then mercy comes. So mercy reaches much further, right, than love. Wow. When mercy reaches us, mercy brings us into a level that is suitable for God's love. Now you understand the difference between mercy and love. Now, 
His mercy reached us even when we were dead in offenses and sins. Then when God's mercy came to us in our dead situation, He made us alive. He made us alive. When we were in the tomb, He made us alive. He enlivened us, right? He uh, put his life into us. Amen. This is the very initial of his salvation. His salvation comes to us by imparting his divine life into us, the died people. Not only uh, made us alive, but also raised us up to make alive is one thing, to raise up is another thing. Uh, you know the story of Lazarus. He was uh, buried in tomb. Then Jesus came to him and uh, made him alive. Then Jesus also raised him up from the tomb. In the same principle, God's mercy came to us, firstly uh, made us alive, then uh, raised us up from the dead. And he made us alive together, and he also raised us up together. In our, to our feeling, you got uh, uh, raised up at your time, yeah. and I got raised up at my time. Yeah. We all were raised up in different times. But in the eyes of God, we were all raised up together. And here together does not uh, refer that we were raised up together with Christ. No, together here means we all were raised up at the same time together. We were together raised up. And uh, we were together raised up in Christ and with Christ. Now, you must see this one point, the salvation which is described here is absolutely from that in Romans. In Romans, the salvation is by God's righteousness. And here, the salvation is by the divine life. Keep this all the time in the mind. You must keep this in your mind because Ephesians is not on a kind of salvation by righteousness to satisfy God's righteous requirements. No, no. Ephesians is on salvation, on a kind of salvation that imparts life into us that we may be members of the body of Christ. Amen. Not to satisfy God's righteous requirement, but to fulfill God's eternal purpose to have a living body for the expression of Christ. To fulfill this purpose, it is not the righteousness required, but life required. So here the salvation is not by righteousness, but by life, making us alive, raising up together, not only uh, raising up together, but also sitting us together. We were made alive together, we were raised up together, and we were seated together. We do have the togetherness. In God's sensation, we were all saved at the same time. You know the type, the type of Exodus, right? In Exodus, it didn't mean that uh, Moses got saved uh, three years 
ago, then uh, Aaron got saved, and then uh, their sister, Marian, got saved, and then after another period of time, this Israelite got saved, another got saved, another got saved. You know, in Exodus, the whole group, the whole congregation of uh, the children of Israel uh, was saved at the same time, right? They passed through the Red Sea in the same night, at the same time. So uh, this was a clear time showing us that in the eyes of God, we were all saved together. Paul was saved 2,000 years ago, and we were saved 2,000 years later. But in the eyes of God, Paul and Wei, Wei and Paul, we were all saved at the same time. We were saved together. Right? We were made alive together. We were raised up together. We were seated in the heavenlies together. <clears throat> seated as where? In the heavenlies. And in Christ. If you read Romans, you could see uh, God's salvation there uh, doesn't uh, bring us to the heavenlies. Where God's salvation uh, uh, brings us to, in Romans, to a righteous position. You see, in Romans, God's salvation brings us into justification, into a position of justification, into a position of being justified. But here in Ephesians, God's salvation by life brings us into the heavenlies. So, we must realize we, the church people today, are in the heavenlies. In the heavenlies. And the heavenlies is a very, very peculiar word. Of course, I don't know Greek this much, but I can say Paul's usage of this word heavenlies is altogether not according to the Greek language. He surely, uh, I believe, invented something and added something to the Greek language. Uh, here, it does not say heavens, but heavenlies. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> what is this? This indicates not only a place, you see, heavenlies not only indicates a place, of course, it indicates the place, but not only. It also indicates a kind of atmosphere, a kind of nature, a kind of uh, characteristic, right? Now, God's salvation by life has brought us into the heavenly place. No doubt about this. And also, this salvation has brought us into an atmosphere, a kind of heavenly atmosphere, a kind of heavenly nature, a kind of heavenly characteristic. You know, even here, we are meeting, right, together. Deep within us, we don't feel that we are so much on this earth, right? We don't have the sensation that we are in the earthly atmosphere. When you get into the theater, uh -huh, uh, when you get into the dancing club, I tell you, you have the deep sensation that in our, in a dark cell, yeah. right? in the gopher hole. But when we meet here, I tell you, I don't have the sensation that we are in a kind of earthly atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We are not in that atmosphere. We are in a kind of atmosphere which is very heavenly, Amen. right? Even with 
the heavenly nature, the heavenly characteristic. Hallelujah. So we are the heavenly people. We are in the heavenlies. God's salvation by life has transferred us into such a kind of atmosphere Amen. with such a heavenly nature and heavenly characteristic. Also, this salvation of uh, uh, life has uh, transferred us into Christ. Of course, in Romans, we are, we are also been uh, told that we have been transferred from Adam into Christ. But there, listen, there in Christ is mostly a matter of position, a justified position. But here Christ, in Christ, is a matter of life, vitality of life, not just a position. See, not just a position of being justified, but a matter of life vitality. We do have the vitality here because we are in Christ. You see, in other words, you have to realize in Romans, Christ is the righteousness of God. But in Ephesians, Christ is life. Right? So in Romans, in Christ means what? In a justified position. But here, in Christ, it means in the life vitality. We are here in a kind of life vitality. Right? Then, uh, this is then, this salvation is then by grace. And the grace has the surpassing riches of God's grace. The surpassing riches. Now, I must check with you. Thus far, after uh, six or seven day uh, training uh, on efficient, thus far, what do you understand by the term grace? What is grace? Now, I believe you all can realize that in Ephesians, grace means what? God dispensed into us. The very God who has been dispensed into us is the grace. Saved by grace means what? Saved by grace means by God. Dispensed and still dispensing into us. Now, you have to give me some kind of a freedom to see this. Again, you see, in Christianity, they always interpret grace as a kind of a something, not a person, right? Saved by grace. That means uh, according to the education I got from Christianity when I was young, grace is just something given you freely. A free gift, that's grace. And uh, they interpret that we sinners don't deserve salvation. But God, anyhow, saved us. Right? Saved us freely. Uh, uh, unmerited. Uh, without any uh, uh, price. And we don't need to pay anything. We uh, are just poor sinners, uh, unable to do anything, and uh, we don't need to do anything, just God, by his first mercy, and then uh, love, and then whatsoever, uh, grace, uh, God saved us. Yeah. Well, this is their kind of a shallow, superficial interpretation. Yeah. But this morning, you have to see, grace came through Jesus Christ. Grace came somewhat like a person. Right? Like a person. And here in Ephesians, from chapter 1, you can see the very saving grace is God himself in Christ wrought into our being. Am I right? We have 
stressed through emphatically in chapter one. The basic controlling factor there is the Trojan God dispensed into our being. I tell you, it is this Trojan God <coughs> that saved us. Amen. So we are saved by grace, means what? We are saved by the dispensed God. The very God who has been dispensed into us saved us. Let me, let me check with you. We all were in that kind of dead, miserable situation. If God had never, came, had never come into us, how could we be saved? <laughs> Am I right? <clears throat> well, I'd like uh, to illustrate a little bit. You know, come here, brother. The salvation of today's Christianity is this. Here is a pitiful person <laughs> fallen into a pit. You see? He is now in a pit. And then I, the Savior, rich in mercy. <laughs> pitiful person. But I love this man with a great love. So what? So I find a way to rescue him. Yeah. Then I drop something. <laughs> I'm on the top. I drop something in the pit. Hi, beautiful man. <laughs> yeah, take it. Oh. Don't be that strong. <laughs> Okay, uh, 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 uh. this is Christianity salvation. <laughs> and this is to be saved by this handkerchief grace. <laughs> handkerchief grace. Just by this way. Don't think I'm mocking. No, no. I surely knew too well. But this is not the salvation in Ephesians. You know what is the salvation in Ephesians? Brother, keep yourself there. <laughs> yeah. The salvation in Ephesians is the incarnated God. And the crucified one. And the resurrected one. And ascended one. Transmit, transmit himself into this person, into this person, and God get into him. Amen. <laughs> Saved by grace. Right. Then now you can see the grace is not handkerchief grace. Amen. Right. The grace is the God grace. Amen. The very God who gets into him. <laughs> Not so neat. <laughs> Not saved. Not saved by a, a handkerchief, <laughs> but by God transmitted into him. <laughs> this transmission, after getting to him, makes him alive. Amen. Amen. Then what? Raises him up. Amen. Then what? Sees him <laughs> into the heavens. Amen. Now you can see what is the grace? The person. Right. Right. The saving person is the grace. Amen. Have you seen it? Amen. This is the grace in Ephesians. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah for such a salvation. Amen. Now you understand this word much, much oh, deeper. Yeah. Say, you are saved by grace. Amen. Don't you understand this word this morning much deeper? Amen. 
Amen. You are saved by grace. Amen. Amen. Who is this grace? The promise is God. Amen. Transmitted into you is the grace. The promise is God, I mean. I tell you, even for God to get into us is not an easy thing. Right. He needs to get through what? Creation, incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Process. Then he is able. His position, he's qualified to transmit himself into us. When he is transmitted into us, he becomes the saving grace. I tell you, this is the abundant grace, not only the amazing grace, the abundant grace. Now you can see. The saving grace is just the process God transmitted into our being. Amen. Oh, brothers and sisters, don't consider this is Brother Lee's interpretation. You read these two chapters, with much prayer, you could see this is the grace. Amen. No other way to interpret the grace in Ephesians chapters 1 and 2. But to tell people this abounding grace, saving grace, is just our God firstly processed, then transmitted into our being. This is to be saved by grace. Amen. Am I right? Is this clear? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, we have been saved in this way. Amen. Right? We have been saved thus by living God yet through much process Amen. and transmitted into our being. Amen. Then we go on. <clears throat> this grace has the surpassing riches. I just don't have the word to tell you. The surpassing riches. Not just one virtue, one attribute, many virtues, many attributes. You just consider this saving grace has how many aspects, right? This saving grace has the light, right? And this saving grace has the life. And this saving grace has the power. No need to say other items. I tell you, this saving grace, which is God himself, wrought into us, has light, life, and power. Amen. Without life, without light, without power, he just couldn't save us. For instance, and this person is falling in pit. If I don't have the energy, you see, if I don't have the strength, how could I, uh, how could I lift him up out of the pit? There is the need of what? There is the need of strength, energy. Not only so, if I don't have love, there's no love. I wouldn't do this. I need the life, I need the power, I need the love, and I need all kinds of wisdom. All these, I tell you, are the riches of this saving grace. Surpassing riches. I just mention a little bit to give you some hint that you can understand the surpassing riches of the saving grace which is the process and transmits God. Then we, can, we go on <clears throat> in kindness. You have mercy, you have love, you have grace, and you have also kindness. 
What is kindness? It's really hard to say. Kindness is something in between mercy and love. <laughs> so I see here, kindness is a benevolent goodness coming out of mercy and love. <laughs> what is this? I don't know. You just consider. <laughs> <laughs> but when God comes to us immersed in love, I tell you, there is something that is called kindness. <laughs> Am I right? And this is to us, and this is in Jesus Christ, and this is to be displayed in the coming age. Still two ages to come. The millennium and eternity. I tell you, in millennium, in the more, in the most, in eternity, what will be displayed there is the saving love, a saving grace, with all its what? Kindness. Well, try to pray read and spend some time. This is all together is by grace. <laughs> right? By grace. Saved by grace. Yet, through faith. What is faith? It's really hard to say. But anyhow, here Paul says, faith is not of ourselves. You believe, right, you believe, but the faith with which you believe is not of yourself. <laughs> faith is not of ourselves. We don't have any faith. But the very marvelous thing is this. At the time when we repent, at the time when we make confession to God, in the name of the Lord Jesus. At that very time, when we made the confession, something came into us. Amen. Just so fast, something came into us. I tell you, that something that came into us was faith. Was faith. Was the believing ability. You know, for years and years and years and years, we were absolutely unable to believe. It's, it was hard for us to believe. For years. But one day, we cannot tell why. We just repented. And we confessed of our sins. Well, we were confessing of our sins. Something got into us. And that something right away became the believing ability. And we believed. Amen. We just believed. People would say with us, you believe in Jesus Christ? Have you ever seen him? You say, no, I've never seen him. <laughs> then why you believe in him? I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. I just had to believe. Oh, you are superstitious. I don't care whether superstition or not superstitious. I cannot help but believe. Yeah. Right. Am I right? I tell you, that is not something of you. Right. That is a fate. Right. Not of yourselves. You know what is that? I tell you, that is a part of the grace. <laughs> that is a part of Jesus Christ. So, the Bible calls the faith of Christ. Paul says, it's no I, but Christ that lives me, and the life that I live, I live not uh, by something else. I live by the faith of Jesus Christ. Faith, I tell you, faith is just Christ himself. You may say, oh, brother, you are always together. You just have nothing. Everything to you is Christ. 
That's really right. The Bible says the faith of Christ. By the faith of Christ. That's right. And the Bible also says the faith is given to us. Right? And also says we receive the faith. The faith. And also said the faith is a common thing. It's common. Come to, come to me. Come to all of us. It's given, it's received, it's common. I tell you, if you put all the verses together, you have to admit this faith must be Jesus Christ. Uh, you may argue with me. Okay? You may argue with me. Please, don't, don't argue. <laughs> I just illustrate a little bit. Of course, I don't have something uh, so precious and so forth. I suppose... Uh, this is a, a piece of diamond. <laughs> diamond. Especially you ladies. You know, you love diamond. Uh huh. When diamond comes to you, right away you have the appreciation. Am I right? You please tell me what is the appreciation? The appreciation is just diamond itself. <laughs> Could you follow me? Okay. I show you a piece of a diamond. Huh? And I show you a piece of a poor sweet potato. <laughs> when you see diamond right away, you have the appreciation. But when you see poor sweet potato, rotten, Thinking. I appreciate. I appreciate. You are so able to appreciate everything. I appreciate. You don't have an appreciation. But Dama, right away you have the appreciation. By this you can see the appreciation does not come out of you. It comes out of what? Yeah, it comes out of what it is. Why don't you believe Socrates? Why don't you believe Confucius? Because <laughs> they are not so believable. <laughs> Am I right? Why do you believe in Jesus Christ? Because he is believable. Right. So your faith actually does not come of you. Your faith comes out of him. Right. Why don't you believe in me? Huh? Why don't you believe in Witness Lee? You say, Poo. <laughs> Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> Who are you? You are absolutely in the words of any believing. We believe in Jesus Christ because he's altogether believable. He's altogether full of faithfulness. Yeah. Seize the faith. I'm right. When we see him, I tell faith comes into us. Amen. I'm right. Amen. Now, have you got it? Yeah. Do you think it is too much to say faith is Christ? Yeah. No. Faith is not Christ. Uh, it's to say faith is Christ is not too much. Just like to say Holiness is Christ. Love is Christ. Righteousness is Christ. Patience is Christ. Endurance is Christ. Faith is also Christ. <sighs> this is why faith comes to us. Faith is given to us and we receive faith. And this is why it doesn't mean you have a kind of faith, I have another kind of faith. Hallelujah. Our faith is common. Same one kind of faith. Why? Because the same one faith is just Christ. Christ visits you. You believe. Christ visits me. I believe. Whosoever Christ would come to, I tell who believes. So the faith does not come out of us, but it comes out of what? The Lord Jesus. Faith is his. 
And he is our faith. So this is not of ourselves. Then you say what? This is the gift of God. This is the gift of God. Because this is Christ. And also, this faith is not of works. Sorry, some Christian teachers interpret this, salvation is not of works. No, here doesn't mean salvation, not of works, but means faith, not of works. That no one should boast. Hallelujah. None of us can boast. We all have to be humble. We all have to say, Lord, if you don't come, I don't have any faith. But praise you, you have come. And I have received faith. You have become my faith. So this is not of our works. Faith comes to us not because of our work. So we have nothing to boast of. Then we go on <clears throat> to the masterpiece of God. Very good. King James says, the workmanship of God. This word is somewhat peculiar. It's somewhat peculiar. Even our translation also uses the word workmanship. Actually, this is a peculiar word. You know, <clears throat> In English, you have the word poem, uh, P-O-E-M, poem. I tell you, poem is an anglicized, anglicized word from Greek. And the Greek word in uh, uh, verse 10 here is just the word for poem. It is all together right to say, for we are his poem. <clears throat> so years and years ago, Brother Nee put out a book. And the subject is the masterpiece of God. And he said, the best translation of this word is to translate it into masterpiece. The masterpiece of God. God made many things. Nothing is so precious, so dear, so valuable, so desirable as the church. I tell you, the church is the masterpiece Today, you know, the writers who compose things, most of the writers, they all have a masterpiece. The best one they compose. That is the masterpiece. We all have to know God created the heavens. Please tell me, are the heavens the masterpiece? No. God created the earth. Is the earth the masterpiece? Even God created man, are men God's masterpiece? No. no. All these are of old creation. Pieces, 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 pieces of God's works. But not one is the masterpiece. Listen, in the whole universe, there's one piece of God's work. Amen. That is the masterpiece. Amen. What piece is this? The church. The church. Do you realize that the church is God's masterpiece? Let me tell you why. It is listed here. <clears throat> the church is the body of Christ, the fullness of the one who fills all in all. You just think over. Could anything be higher, better than this? The body of Christ. The fullness 
of him that fills all in all. I tell you, even we don't have the utterance to describe. This is really the masterpiece. <coughs> then what? The new man, corporate and universal. Do you all believe that today we are the body? Say it. Amen. Do you all believe that we will be the new man? Yes. Culprit and universal? Amen. Of course, today we are in the kitchen. Right? We are in the kitchen. We are not on the dining table yet. In the kitchen, we see a lot of... Uh, what? Messing up. We probably do not have much revelation that this is the masterpiece. <laughs> right? We do not have much realization that the church is God's masterpiece. We would say, my, what can church life is this? This is just a messing up. Right? Huh. Wait a while. <laughs> Wait a while. We will not only be just the body, the fullness of Christ, but also the new man. Amen. The new man. Uh, why it is the masterpiece? Let me tell you. You have to realize, even to God, this is a new invention. <laughs> new invention. Why? Because this piece, this masterpiece, is the mingling of God with man. Wow. Hallelujah. God mingles himself with man. This is a new invention. Have you, have you ever thought about it? You do have a word, but not so positive. Hybrid. hybrid. I tell the church is in hybrid. I'm right? Yeah. Two kinds of lives blended together. Amen. Our opposers say, we have a uh, what? We have uh, <sighs> made the church God. <clears throat> Actually, we don't see that. But we do say the church is the mingling of God with man. Amen. I tell you, this is the top invention. To uh, make man one with God and to uh, work God into man. This is the masterpiece. We don't have any human word to describe the very characteristics of this invention. What I can tell you according to the Bible is that God has worked himself into the church. So this is the masterpiece. A kind of new invention. So it is a poem. You know, what is a poem? A poem is a very artistic piece of work to express the wisdom, the design, and the beauty of the maker. Every poetry, yeah, every poem utters what? Utters the wisdom, the design, and the beauty of the writer. 
Am I right? <sighs> to God, the church is just his poetry. His poem that utters his wisdom. Even chapter 3 says, So the church to make known God's manifold wisdom. Amen. Right? When you sing the hymns, right, you could realize the wisdom of all the writers. I tell you, in the coming age, in the millennium, and in eternity, there will be a unique hymn. Amen. The hymn on the church. Amen. I tell you, that poem will utter will describe the wisdom, the design, and the and beauty of God. So the church is the poem, the poetry, the masterpiece. I hate, I don't have that much utterance, but you look at the church, shut up your eyes, don't look at yourself, just look at the church. The body of Christ. You will see, brother, I cannot apprehend anything. Okay, you just shut up your eyes and look at the New Jerusalem. Okay, look at the New Jerusalem. Look, look at New Jerusalem. What would you say? You would say, my, my, what a design, right? What a wisdom, what a beauty. I tell you, the whole New Jerusalem is a poetry. It's a poem. And that is the masterpiece of God. New heavens will be there. New earth will be there. And the nations will be there. All animals, all plants will be there. Among all this is the New Jerusalem. You look at the New Jerusalem, you have to say, my, this is the best hymn that has ever been written in the whole universe. Wow. The New Jerusalem is the best hymn. That is the poetry, poem, composed by God. Amen. Displaying what? Displaying his wisdom, wow. his design, and his beauty. Amen. So that is the masterpiece. I tell you, this is the thought, the concept of Apostle Paul when he wrote chapter 2. And this masterpiece is for God's good works. And these good works, not uh, according to our thinking but prepared by God beforehand. Here it says, we have to walk in these good works. We have to walk in these in this good works. According to the context of the whole book, entire book of Ephesians, we can find out what are these good works. Number one, to do God's will. Number two, to live a church life. That is the body life. And number three, to bear the testimony of Jesus. Amen. I tell you, these are the good works. The good works are the will of God, the body life, which is the church life, and the testimony of Jesus. We must walk in these three things. We walk in God's will, we walk in the church life, and we walk in the testimony of Jesus. These are the good works which God prepared, ordained beforehand that we should walk in as the masterpiece of God. Well, I feel I better stop here and you spend some time in the afternoon to uh, fellowship about it and prepare it and get yourself into it, right? You need to spend at least uh, one hour for this message. 
I hope you could pick up three main points saved by Greece. Number one. And the masterpiece. Number two. And the good works. When you prepare your lesson on this message, you must pick up these three main points. Saved by grace. What is grace? What can salvation is this? Saved by grace. Then you have to see the masterpiece. The masterpiece out of God's salvation by life. Then the good works. Right? Take care of these three things. Hallelujah. We have been saved by God himself as grace to be the masterpiece that we may walk in the good works preordained for all of us to walk in. Right? Take care of these three things. Now, try to see something along this line. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Follow us on social media or visit our website for more from Living Stream Ministries.